the error is in the language that we use or the language that we're led to use all the time. Today's CPI was blistering hot. The Fed needs to come in and pour cold water, cool the economy down. We're led to believe that CPIs are a reflection of the underlying economic fundamentals in any given period. So if a CPI is red hot, that must mean the economy is likewise. Therefore, we need someone to come in and cool everything off, lest it continue to be inflationary for a, per a prolonged period of time. But that's the error. Even you go back to 2021 and the early part of 2022, even the most polished of CEO, corporate CEOs and management teams had made the same mistake. I mean, after all, we had that one famous investor by the name of Warren Buffett talk about how the economy was red hot and that was going to lead to inflationary pressures. Everyone said so. Everybody said as the CPI goes up, that tells us something not just about consumer prices, but the state of the recovery itself. And so corporate CEOs looked at that and said, cha-ching, baby. Let's get ready for business to be prosperous for a prolonged period of time, at least until Jay Powell and the FOMC finally comes in and cools everything down. As I said, it's in the language, but it's a mistake. It's a big mistake, and it's a mistake that we're led to, led to make for very transparent reasons. Now, there is a case, a very definitive, even dispositive case, which exposes this mistake, this fundamental error, and conclusively shows that at least over the last couple of years, consumer prices have been unrelated to economic conditions. They have been instead driven, have been driven by a combination of non-economic factors, as well as government interventions, creating a very different set of circumstances, which leads us to a very different uh, set of scenarios moving into the future. Now, before we get to that, and before we go over today's CPI report, which I'm gonna agree with Jay Powell on it here. First, I'm Jeff, this is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me, I do appreciate it. I also appreciate all the Eurodollar University members, and if you're interested in becoming one, you will get access to exclusive videos where we detail all of the monetary truths, for lack of a better term, the facts, the history, the background, how the monetary system actually works so that you can understand what markets are doing, what they're telling us, the implications in the financial system as well as the real economy. I also offer uh, research subscriptions, a daily briefing in partnership with Markets Insider Pro. We go over the biggest, most moving macro data in any given day, like today's CPI report, as well as what's the most important part of some curve movement in the euro dollar system, whatever the case may be. And I also do a deep dive analysis at Eurodollar University daily there as well, where we dive deep into all of these things to truly understand what's going on today, understanding where we came from yesterday so that we can be prepared for tomorrow. All the information available at eurodollar.university. What may be, what really is the most compelling, convincing, even um, inarguable case which shows that consumer prices, especially in our current age, our current era, the post-2020 environment, have nothing to do with legitimate inflation, have nothing to do with money printing, have nothing to do with red hot economies or overheating or the language of temperature that's always used when talking about consumer prices. I'm talking about, of course, Japan, the land that has become famous for lost decades in deflation, cooling, cold. So maybe there's something to this. But anyway, we have Japan, Japan, which for the first time in forever, is experiencing a serious bout of consumer price pressures. In fact, Japan's CPI has gone up in this core CPI have gone up to levels not seen since the early 1980s, just like other places around the world. So J Japan CPI, which has nothing to do with QQE, nothing whatsoever to do with the level of bank reserves. So it's not money printing. We know that in fact, bank reserves went way up in 2020 
Japan's CPI actually contracted in 2020. Japan's actually, uh, the Bank of Japan is restricting bank reserves in 2022. Japan's CPI accelerates in a way we haven't seen in Japan in four decades. The closest the Japanese got to reaching anything resembling inflation was back in 2014 when the government instituted a VAT tax. So again, not economics. So we look at Japan in the post-2022, or the post-20 environment, and what you see very clearly is an economy that is so far from red hot, so far from overheating, you could never make that mistake of calling it that. Japan's recovery has been very much a lack of recovery. GDP, industrial production, household spending, any number of macro accounts, it doesn't matter. You look at any one of them and they show you Japan, the output, the level of business activity, spending, all of it is way less today than it had been before we got into the, Japan got into the pandemic or let alone where Japan was in 2017 and 2018. Japan is even close to recovering from a recession that began almost more than four years ago. So we're talking very clear evidence that you can absolutely, unmistakable evidence that shows an economy that is nowhere near hot, cold, freezing, whatever. If you want to use the language of temperature, Japan is the opposite of overheating. And that's gotten even, it's even more the case as 2022 closed out because now it looks like Japan may be heading into a recession. GDP declined by about a quarter of a percentage point in the third quarter and then only came back not the whole way in the fourth quarter. So much less activity in Japan moving into the second half of last year, even as consumer prices accelerated rapidly. So we have an economy that never, ever recovered from the last recession, an economy that looks like it's rolling over anyway toward a, the next recession, and yet consumer prices are accelerating to a 40-year high. Not money printing. It's not the Fed, or excuse the Fed, Bank of Japan, what's the difference? It's not a central bank. It's not bank reserves. It's not an overheated economy. It's an economy that was at least moving forward, but now seems to be moving in reverse. And yet consumer prices are going up because this was always about the non-economic global factors tied to supply. The constriction in supply, even as modest rebounds in demand across places like Japan and elsewhere, created the small e economic imbalance. When demand goes up and supply can't meet it, the only way to reconcile that situation is through higher prices. Regardless of the temperature of the economy, it has nothing to do with the monetary system, entirely about supply constraints. But here's the thing. I know I say that all the time, but here's the thing. In a supply shock case, like we see not just in Japan, but Japan as the the most the starkest example of everything else going on in the global economy, it doesn't end with a 1970s style takeoff. It doesn't end with a soft landing. It ends with a global economy, individual economies reverting back to their original state. So for Japan, that really, uh, you really have to worry about the Japanese, which is why the Bank of Japan is nowhere near raising rates. But again, it's not just about Japan. So now we have today's CPI report in the US, having established that CPIs are unrelated to red hot economies. So the CPI can be red hot and it has nothing to say about the actual underlying economic fundamentals or circumstances in which that CPI is reporting. I have to agree with Mr. Jay Powell here. Jay Powell, remember at his last uh, press conference said, quote, we can now say, I think for the first time that the disinflationary process has started. We can see that and we can, we see it really in goods prices so far. Not only can I see this in the CPI, obviously the marketplace can see it too, because markets up until today 
had reacted with each new CPI is confirming the suspicions there. And even today, you can see that mostly the reaction to the CPI is based on what people think the Fed will do about it, not what it actually represents in terms of the, again, economic underlying economic fundamentals. So why is that the case? Well, let's go through the numbers first. Let's go through some of the details and let's break them down so that we can understand what this data is actually telling us. So first of all, we have the headline CPI, which accelerated to 0.52% month over month. These are seasonally adjusted numbers. Um, and the BLS just yesterday reported its updated seasonal factors, which we don't need to get into here because it's not really important to what we're discussing. Just so that you're aware that the seasonally adjusted data for the CPI has been revised over the last several years. Um, the unadjusted data, by the way, is never revised because it's not allowed to be revised. So the headline CPI accelerated 0.52% month over month. The year over year was 6.3% versus 6.4% versus December. So only a modest reduction in the uh, year, the annual rate. And the reason I don't think no, anybody was surprised because gasoline prices accelerated in January. They rebounded from lows in, uh, from December. So we knew the CPI was going to be higher because of a higher contribution from gasoline. But it wasn't just gasoline, as we can see in the core CPI. The core CPI, which excludes energy and food prices, was up 0.41% month, month over month, which was practically the same as 0.40% uh, month over month in December. So we have the same level of, of increase in January as December in the core rate, and 0.4% that, if you just do some simple math, if 0.4% every month, you're going to get to 5% at an annual rate, which is well above where the Fed wants it to be. So the core rate looks like it's red hot or still too hot. Not as hot as earlier in the year, but still much hotter than it should be if we were in what Jay Powell said was the disinflationary process. Year over year, the core CPI was 5.6% versus 5.7% in December, so not much change there at all. So if, you're, if, you're, if your sole focus is how will the Fed treat the CPI, from where we're starting from, it looks like the Fed's going to have to raise more rates, or the Fed's going to believe it needs to raise rates further to cool off an economy that doesn't seem to want to cool off by all this temperature, uh, this, this temperature stuff. But just as the headline rate was driven by gasoline, the core rate was driven by something else. And we look at, first of all, when you look at the annual comparisons, we have to keep in mind that those contain the first, in the first five months of this 12 month window, the months of February, March, April, May, and June of last year, which were some of the biggest, most heavily influenced uh, uh, consumer price uh, months in the entire last several decades, so going back a long time. So in our annual comparisons, we begin with rapid consumer price acceleration. Of course, everything changed after June into July. So the annual comparisons are high because of what happened before, but even when we look at something like the, the, core, the core CPI, the monthly numbers still make it appear as if consumer prices are a thorough problem and not really getting much better. And we've talked about why that is. It's not gasoline, it's the imputation of how the CPI or how the folks at the, the BLS try to come up with rental prices. And rental prices, by and large, are a reflection of housing prices with an enormous lag. And since housing prices went way up in 2021, we now have rental prices or rental imputations that are going way up in 2022 and still going up in 2023. When you look at the CPI in terms of shelter as well as owner's equivalent rent, which is a huge part of the CPI bucket, you still see rapid acceleration. Even though it decelerated a little bit in January, it's both of those are still rising at monthly rates of 0.7%, which is verging on double digits at an annual rate. So rental prices, or at least what the BLS can make sense of or try to make sense of rental prices, are the reason why the monthly core rates continue to be uncomfortable. The BLS actually puts together an index which excludes food, energy, as well as shelter. 
And I know what people say. Yeah, when you take away all the stuff that is going up really quickly, the, inf the CPI looks really good. So if you take away all the inflation, you don't find any inflation. But what we're tr really trying to look at and what we're really interested in here is the underlying economic fundamentals as much as any CPI can tell us those. And so if we exclude the non-economic influence of gasoline prices, because let's face it, that has nothing to do with the economy. That's all about supply constraints. And if we remove the imputations of shelter prices, which is all about housing prices from last year, tells us nothing about this year, then we might have a better sense of the what may be happening in terms of consumer prices in economic terms, small e economic terms. And so you look at the all items x food, energy, and shelter, and what you see in January was just 0.17% month over month. And it's the fourth straight month of, I agree with Jay Powell, ugh, I hate to say that, that the disinflationary process has started. When you get away from energy, when you get away from rent, what you see is that consumer prices aren't just normal, they've reverted back to, again, the pre-2020 disinflationary state because 0.17% in January, but over the last four months since September, because this is a four month period, uh, the annual the, the CPI excluding those items is up at an annual rate of just 1.26%. And even going back to June, it's up only a 2.6%. So away from the influence of shelter prices and away from the influence of gasoline, the disinflationary process has indeed begun. And again, as I said before, you can see why markets reacted so sharply, so decisively, to the October CPI, which was, which was released in early November. Because the October CPI is really when it became clear, or clear enough, that all of the things that we had suspected, the markets had suspected and priced into curves about this being a supply shock and really being the downside of the supply shock finally showing up, finally showed up in the CPI too. In this particular index, you see away from all those other non-economic influences, the economy has indeed moved to the other side of this quote unquote, quote unquote, inflationary trend. But as I said, that's the bad news. Because what happens, because the economy was never red hot, it was never really recovering when CPIs were accelerating, what that means is, as in Japan and everywhere else, the economy is likely reverting back to its potential, its prior settled state, whatever you want to call it. Economists like to call it an equilibrium. When everybody equated the CPIs with the economic fundamentals, everybody thought the equilibrium was way up here. Maybe we had even gotten out of the post-crisis, post-2008 crisis rut because CPIs, all of that's overheating. We've overdone it. No. And now that now that we understand that CPIs are non-economic in nature, we're reverting back to, at best, the pre-2020 potential and baseline, which is something I talked about recently, or... Even worse, what if the 2020 recession, pandemic, gover government overreactions, all of that stuff actually harmed the long run economic potential more than it had been harmed after the 2008 recession, which wasn't a recession, which means 2020 wasn't a recession. And as consumer prices come down, what we're finally seeing is the underlying economic factors and fundamentals. So Japan showed us quite conclusively, global inflation was never inflation, nor was it a red hot economy. And today's CPI in the US might convince the Fed it needs to hike more rates. I don't particularly care about that outside the short run. I'm more concerned like the markets are about the fundamentals which are shown in the CPI data itself too. I'm Jeff, this is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. As always, a huge thank you to Eurodollar University members and our research subscribers. And until next time, everyone do take care.